worship today with Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Chris Miller, and I'm glad you're here with us today. If this is your first time joining us for worship, thanks for spending some time with Trinity today. If you'd like to learn more about our congregation and how you can get involved, please visit us online at trinitysprinfieldpcusa.org. I have two announcements about our life together. First, I want to remind you that tomorrow, Monday, June 29th, Trinity is going to be holding our next curbside food drive supporting the Merciful Knights Initiative, Rare Breed, and Cross Lines. We're preparing 300 meal kits to help cover the July 4th weekend. Each kit will provide someone in shelter with two meals. We need non-perishable, easy-to-open items to help fill out these kits like peel top fruit cups, granola bars, and individually packaged servings of breakfast cereal. We're also collecting new in-package socks. We have all the details on our website, in the newsletter, and on social media. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, Monday, June 29th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and again from 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. with your donations here at the church. Secondly, I want to extend a special welcome to the Reverend Brian Ellison, who will be sharing part of our worship service later on today. Brian, we're blessed to have you with us in worship. Friends, it's good to be with you. Let us worship God together. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 89. Hear this prayer of praise from Scripture. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made my covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Amen. We sing our first hymn to God's praise. The God of Abraham prays. prepare for a time of confession, we remember that we are no longer enslaved to sin, but set free through grace to be instruments of righteousness. Therefore, we come before God to confess the ways we fail to follow Christ and neglect to care for one another. 
we offer to God our confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, our loyalties have been divided and we have taken your grace for granted. You seek us out, but we attempt to go our own way. You provide, but we hoard. You free us from enslavement to sin, but we neglect to be instruments of righteousness. You welcome us as we are, but we refuse to receive others in your name. Forgive what we have been, amend what we will be. Awaken us to the new thing you are doing within and around us. Send your spirit to shape us in ways that better reflect the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. We offer now to God our personal prayers of confession. Let us pray. Amen. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe the good news and be at peace. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We turn now to our children's sermon. Hi, my Trinity kids, it's Carla. Well, today in our main service, we have a guest speaker, and he is talking about something that is really kind of hard. I'm glad he's talking about it, not me. But it's about when Abraham was asked by God to make a huge sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice no parent would want to make. I'm not going to give away the ending of the story, but I want to tell you it ended really happy. And the main point behind that is Abraham was willing to do whatever God needed him to do. Although Abraham didn't understand it, he had that heart and he was willing to, to do it. So this leads to my true message to you today. The mask. Yes, I can admit it. I've had a little bit of a hard time with this mask. And you know, I want to, at first I'm like, well, it's just so odd. But is it really odd? I mean, whenever I had my four children, the doctors in the room, all of them had on masks, the nurses. Why? Because they didn't want to give germs to that little baby, my baby, and I was thankful for that. How about you when you've gone to the dentist? Your dentist always wears a mask. And why is that? So your dentist doesn't give you any germs because you're so close. Well, you know, in the Bible, there's over a hundred different times that it talks about us being good neighbors. And what is a good neighbor? The old English uh, definition of neighbor is ne, which means near, and geber, which means dweller, near dweller. So anybody that dwells near to us. That's our neighbor. And so now we find it our turn to protect each other. Because until we have a, a vaccine or something that we can protect ourselves against the coronavirus, this has been proven to be the best thing. So I have a challenge for you. I would like all of you that would to put on your masks and send me a picture of you. I'm always looking for some fun and unique ways to liven up our services. And so I have something up my sleeve, but I need your help. And I need you sending me pictures of you and your mask. So um, in our newsletter, I have left my phone number and my email address. And if your parents wouldn't mind just shooting a little picture of you and your mask and sending it my way, that would be awesome. And just remember, this is a way now that we all are protecting each other, just like those doctors and dentists and other people have always done for us. We're now doing it for each other. Okay, would all of you bow your heads with me and say the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. I can't wait to uh, see you sometime, hopefully sooner than later. I love you. Bye-bye. Let us pray. 
Lord, the noise around us is loud and the distractions intense. We yearn to hear your voice in order to know of your presence and hear again your covenant promise. Quiet our busy minds, calm our anxious hearts, come to us now and speak for we are listening. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 13 verses 1 through 6. Listen for God's word to you today. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord. My God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. Amen.
Hi, my name is Brian Ellison. I'm stated clerk of the Synod of Mid-America, which is a Presbyterian council that covers uh, all the Presbyterian churches in Kansas and Missouri and uh, six counties in Western Illinois. It is really a pleasure and a privilege to be joining you for worship this morning. And I know there's churches throughout the Synod and in fact throughout the country who are using this video sermon today. And we're grateful for the chance, grateful to be able to support you and your congregation and its ministry as you try to uh, continue to worship together in this virtual way. Uh, we especially uh, thank your pastors, and I hope you will thank them too for all the hard work and good work they're doing in these very difficult times. Let us tend now to God's Word as it comes to us in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 22, the first 14 verses. Listen for God's Word. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. And then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God is himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built there an altar and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This Bible story, the story of the near sacrifice of Isaac, is one of the first ones I remember learning in Sunday school. I don't know how old I was exactly when it came up in the lesson plans, uh, whether it was in Grandma Nutt's kindergarten class. She wasn't really my grandma. She was the mother of my dad's brother's wife, but close enough. The class where the stories got acted out by paper figures stuck to a flannel sheet. Or maybe it was Mrs. Capps's first grade class where we got stars on the chart for remembering Bible verses like the Lord will provide, which to be honest, I actually was reading off of the chalkboard where they had been erased from the previous week, but not fully washed away. It's a Bible story I found that a lot of people who grew up in church remember. A person can get nostalgic hearing these old stories like this one about faith and commitment, about devotion and sacrifice, can't we? The first time I preached on this text was when, in my first call as a pastor in Parkville, Missouri, for the reading of this story, we had a father and his eight-year-old son enact portions of this text, walking up the aisle of the church, carrying a pile of wood for the altar, pausing at the front as the son, his only son, whom we all loved, knelt and waited. 
And that is the moment that I thought about this sacred text, what I can't believe I hadn't thought about before, that I hadn't thought of when I heard it as a five-year-old, that I hadn't thought of since. This is a terrible story. I looked at that dad standing there, an elder, a businessman, standing there with his hand on his son's shoulder. I looked at the sweet face of the kid who came to the early service in his soccer uniform on Sundays when he had a game. And I thought, why in God's name did Grandma Nutt put this on a flannel graph? How did parents and pastors even let children hear this story? Abraham is supposed to be a hero of God's people, but what kind of father would raise a knife to their son, no matter what some voice from heaven told him? And what kind of God, frankly, would ask a father to do such a thing, regardless of how the story is supposed to end? It is terrible. It's a story of brokenness, not beauty. It's a story of anguish, violence, horror. From the first time Abraham hears the Lord's voice, the story walks toward death, death looming like a mountain. Even if there is sun rising behind that mountain of death, Abraham, Isaac, you and I, we're walking toward the mountain in its shadow. And I am not sure the ending feels so much like resolution as a pause a moment frozen. Isaac is still alive, but we are wounded. This year, this moment feels immersed in anguish. There is fear in the air, fear of a virus we cannot see, but which is wreaking real pain and suffering, sometimes in people we love. There is holy anger at the murders of black people in this country and deep soul searching about the white supremacy that since our founding has underlay every aspect of our country's culture and politics and law. Protests in our streets, violent or not, are designed to unsettle us and we need some unsettling. So accustomed have we become to ignoring the truth before our eyes, defying our senses, even our conscience. And whether it is police sirens or pangs of conscience or the beeping of a loved one's respirator that's keeping us awake in this moment, waking up is precisely what is needed. Waking up, after all, is the difference between death and life. You see, the story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac isn't just terrible, it is also true. And the more I read this story now, as an adult, I see Abraham not just as the hundred-year-old man with a long beard and sandals on the flannel board, not even as the symbol of God's ancient people. I see him as me. I see him as you. It's, of course, the story of a man who is devoted. That's what our Sunday school teachers wanted us to see. A man who, like us, in our stumbling and imperfect ways, tries to do the right things, tries to hear God's voice and do what God wants us to do. Abraham will go to great lengths to do what, in a moment, he perceives to be right. And I bet you will, too. An act of extravagant generosity or unusual boldness. We can be courageous people. But we also, like Abraham, can be impulsive people, can't we? And I refuse to believe that whoever first put pen to paper or stylus to papyrus or whatever grandparent first told this story around a fire to their grandchildren 3,000 years ago, I refuse to believe that they didn't know how barbaric it was to suggest that Abraham offering to kill his son was an act of devotion. They knew it was a terrible story when they told it. And maybe the best way for us to hear this story is as a cautionary tale, a word of warning about how we, in our acts of devotion or in our acts of impulse, sometimes do exactly the wrong thing. I see it in my own life and in the lives of those around me. 
Maybe our desire to keep the peace leads us to tolerate and defend a system that brings death and calamity to people of color, silence paving the way for death. Or maybe our desire to be generous with our own individual acts of compassion or care blinds us to the need for systemic changes that would lift generations and neighborhoods from persistent poverty. Or maybe our desire to worship and share in God's gift of fellowship and community leads to our giving ourselves permission to gather too soon, putting public health and the lives of friends and strangers at risk. Abraham was devoted to God, but faith was never designed to operate without sense. Following never meant putting on a blindfold. Obedience can never use ignorance as an excuse. Let's be honest, that's how well-meaning missionaries ended up establishing colonial rule over nations and peoples, forming patterns of dependence and oppression. That's how talk of morals and values kept LGBTQ people out of the church and away from the gospel and sometimes from the Thanksgiving dinner table and the love of their families. And that's how Abraham found himself walking toward the mountain to kill his son. When I hear the angel of the Lord crying out as Abraham raises the knife, I don't hear appreciation in the angel's voice. I hear terror. Wait! What are you doing? Wake up, Abraham. Get a hold of yourself, man. Abraham didn't so much pass the test as he forced God to cancel the exam. All right, all right, I know you fear God. Now untie your son, for God's sake. And only then does this story become bearable. Only when the story's trajectory is disturbed, only when Abraham does not do the thing that in obedience he thought he was called to do, only when he changes his plan does this story become one of not death, but life. It would be many centuries after these stories were first told that Paul would write to the Romans about death and life in their bodies. He wrote in another shadow of death, this one a cross-shaped shadow, remembering one who had offered his own body, another innocent lamb, another beloved son. And to a group of Christians who dare to say they've been changed, transformed by God's power, to a group of believers who are striving to worship God not only by building altars in certain places, but in how they live, Paul writes... Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. Our story, yours and mine I mean, is set in a place of anguish and brokenness, of violence and death. And it would be so easy to let the sin that is all around us exercise dominion over us too, to be ruled by it. And what Paul names for us is that it doesn't have to be that way, that we have control, we have agency over these bodies of ours, our members, our hands and feet, our minds and our mouths. They are tools or they are weapons. They are instruments of wickedness or they are instruments of righteousness. They are knives for slaying our nation's children or they are knives for cutting loose the ropes that bind them. They are torches for destroying the homes and lives of our neighbors, or they bear the flames that will burn down walls that divide and structures that imprison. Which will it be, people of God? Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, the scripture says, for it will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law 
but under grace. In Jesus Christ, God has delivered an expansive, powerful grace, stronger than law, freedom from bondage, an end to humanity laid on altars to be sacrificed, and the beginning of humanity set free for transformation of a broken world. And at the end of the encounter on the mountaintop, we are told that God provides a ram caught in a thicket. A ram, not a lamb, like Abraham had told Isaac God would provide, A ram, older, less perfect. In a way, it's a bit of a messy ending to a story that we can see was pretty messy to begin with, just like our stories. The story moves from death to life. But the life it moves to, well, it isn't easy. It isn't idealized. It isn't complete. It just continues. And it will be up to Abraham and Isaac to decide its next steps. And whether the future will hold more violence and terror or something different. That is life. And that is our story too. We stand there, a moment frozen, wounded, but alive. So friends, given the grace now to go back down the mountain, how will we use our tools, our weapons? Will they be instruments of wickedness or of righteousness? What will you and I do to follow God out of the shadow and work to bring the world from death to life? Thank you, Brian, for your message. We turn now to our morning's offering. We respond to God's grace with gratitude made evident in the joyful giving of a portion of what God has entrusted to us. Freely we have received, freely let us give. I invite you to participate in the financial life of Trinity through the sharing of your gifts. You can find information on how to give on our website, Trinity Springfield, PCUSA.org. Let us worship God with our morning's offering.
Let us pray. Loving God, you provide for us in countless and surprising ways. You give us the gift of creation, the community of the church, the love of friends and family. You surround us with the great cloud of witnesses to inspire and cheer us. The Spirit intercedes for us and Christ right now prays for us. Accept and bless these gifts we offer in thanksgiving Use them to show others your promised love and care. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you now join me in a time of prayer for our community, our world, and the church? Let us pray. Lord God, we bow in prayer, humbled by the reality that you want to spend time with us. You long to be in relationship with us. You receive us and care for us no matter where we have been, what we have done, or how often we have neglected your will. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us, such grace beyond our comprehension. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin and alive to the transformation you promise. Awed by your mercy and kindness, we seek to respond with bold faith. Strengthen our resolve to follow where Christ leads and obey his commandment to love. In a world overflowing with anger and division, send us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. In the wake of injustice and pain, use us as instruments of righteousness and healing. As creation groans for relief, make us bearers of hope and catalysts of life-giving change. When our faith is tested and we do not feel up to the demands of discipleship, remind us that you provide. Help us to remember the ram in the thicket, the manna in the desert, the water from the rock, and the feeding of the 5,000. Send your Holy Spirit to spark our imagination and embolden our witness so that none of your little ones are hungry or thirsty. Free from sin and alive in Jesus Christ, we pray without reserve for those people and places, circumstances, and situations that weigh on our hearts and minds this day. We ask you to provide healing to the sick. We look to you to ease the suffering of those hurting in body, mind, and spirit. We plead on behalf of the long oppressed and for those still waiting for justice. We yearn for you to guide all of those in positions of leadership to make decisions that reflect your will. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin, alive, and awaiting the transformation you promise. We make our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing our final hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
It's been good to be with you today. And as you go out, hear this promise. As God's own, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and patience, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And crown all these things with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.